Scaling. Scaling is one of those things that, as developers, we're often guilty of ignoring early on. You know, it is hard, so we kind of go, eh, we'll write that later, it's fine. It's only when the spikes start happening, when you know, your application is getting slower and slower, and then you get into a team meeting, you go, yeah, we probably ought to fix that. There's a lot of different routes we can take uh, when it comes to scaling. This talk covers some of the basic approaches, some things that you could perhaps do to an existing application, as well as some things that you might want to consider if you're building a new application. Now, before I go any further, I just want to say, you know, thank you to, to you guys for coming to this talk. Thank you to the conference for having me. This is my first time at Scotland PHP. Um, already, I think it's an awesome conference. These things take an awful lot of work. So, you know, there's the time, there's money, there's making sure everyone's here, make sure the venue's here, the food, the speakers, everything. You know, if you do get time during the conference and you speak to one of the organizers, just, you know, say thanks. Because without the people putting in all this effort, these conferences and this community wouldn't exist. So who am I? Um, my name's Liam Wiltshire, as it says there. Um, and I'm a CTO which basically just means I'm a senior engineer, but somehow I was made management, um, for a company called Tebex. Now, Tebex is a, is a small company, uh, but we provide uh, payment platforms and, and infrastructure for game servers like some of those, which is awesome because my kids, for the first time ever, think I'm cool uh, because I know these YouTubers and stuff, and I, I don't know who they are, but whatever. So, scaling is a massive topic. There's no way we could cover all of scaling in an hour or 50 minutes. There are hundreds of articles and books and you know, all sorts of things you can look at. So this is very much an introduction to the topic. Some things we are going to look at is kind of, first of all, why we would need to, why we would need to scale in the first place. Look at some of the high level strategies, some things that actually you could go back on your applications and apply them straight away. We are also going to look at you know, some of the different kind of buzzwords you might have heard um, and how they can and, and might not be applied and, and also things that we can look at on new products as well. Before we do any of that, I feel I need to give a bit of context to the, the Tebex platform. Um, the Tebex platform is, is the thing that runs our entire business, so all our uh, merchants use it, we use it for administration, anyone who's on a game server uses it and so on. So it starts off quite easy. We have an admin panel. It's written in Laravel. It uses admin LTE. Um, it's not been updated in about three years. Um, and yeah, fine. No one uses it, so it's all good. Then we have the control panel. This gets quite a lot of use because it does all the customer reporting. All our merchants who are editing their stores use it to set their products, set their categories, design their templates, whatever it is they're doing. It doesn't just pull in data from a database, but from third-party APIs and services that we use to do stats and analytics. But again, so far, nothing that exciting. Then it gets interesting. Every single customer on our platform has one or more web stores. These are unique to the customer, uh, and obviously it shows their categories and their products, and it pulls in their custom themes and the sales that they're running and whatever else. At the moment, we have just over 610,000 stores. Then they're attached to, web ser uh, to game servers. Each web store has at least one game server, um, but also can have MySQL servers attached to them, Archon servers, uh, Discord, all sorts of things. The game servers phone home at different intervals. So if you're on an enterprise plan, it phones home every two minutes. If you're on the free plan, it phones home every quarter of an hour. Um, to ask for any commands that need to be run on that server. Uh, on top of that, when you're in-game, you can actually see a list of the products that are for sale. So it has to query our servers and go, okay, what products can I sell on this server right now? Um, we're also looking at doing some push commands. So we now actually have a server plugin that also runs a HTTP server so that we can actually fire commands to it in real time, uh, which is really cool. But it means there's a lot of traffic going on. You know, there are about 750,000 game servers connected to our platform at the moment. So we, yeah, we, we do a fair bit of traffic. 
on a, on a normal day, on a nice quiet Monday morning where no one's playing, um, it's about half a million, 600,000 requests, requests an hour. But okay, that's good. Often that will spike to maybe three or four times that, so up to perhaps two million. Black Friday is a big one. Whenever one of our enterprise customers runs a sale and doesn't tell us, uh, which often happens a lot. Um, Christmas Day is a funny one. You know, I always go, Christmas Day, you don't want to be on your computer. Um, but, you know, even on Christmas Day, we'll serve 1.4 million requests in an hour. Um, one, of our, one of our merchants in December last year made a million dollars. So fair enough to them. Um, on top of that, we have kind of this underlying uh, DOS attack. I, I, I call it an attack. It doesn't work, so it's not really an attack. But they try, bless them. Uh, and that tends to be, you know, when we look at our, our analytics, there's, there's about 100,000 requests an hour just, just always going on, ticking along. We had one in, recently that was quite interesting where they tried to hit us with a million requests an hour uh, to try and knock us over. Still didn't work. Anyway, enough of the boring stuff. No one cares about that. Why do we need to scale? I'm going to be honest. If I didn't have to worry about scaling, I wouldn't. It's, it's hard. We, in effect, having to scale is because you're being too successful. How dare you? We get to a point where we're handling too much data, too much traffic. In other words, there's a load problem somewhere. This is why we need to scale. What are the first? They're, they're kind of three phases. When you start getting these clues, that perhaps you need to think about how your application is scaling. First of all, you end up with slow performance. So yeah, users are trying to get onto your application. They're having to wait for resources to be available, perhaps having to wait for a DB connection to free up, or you know, the DB is being slow returning queries, or they're having to wait for an available connection, whatever else. But, but you know, they get there. It's slow, but it is manageable. You then start seeing outages. So you know, for most people, it's still working. 90% of your requests are being fulfilled, but now and again, it's just starting to drop requests, and people are getting you know, uh, unavailable errors, things like that. And then eventually, you get full-on unavailability. High load causes your server to thrash. Everything goes down. Because you know, Linux is helpful. It goes, hey, I see you're using all your memory. And MySQL is using lots of memory. Let me help you there by killing MySQL. No. Why would you do that? <laughs> but it's trying to be helpful. So if you get to the unavailability stage, you need to you know, make some changes PDQ. Um, so what are the things that we can do quickly to get back up and running? Separating concerns um, is, is effectively, it's, it's just a fancy way of saying putting stuff on different servers. That, that's all it really means, right? Normally, the, what we think about is putting our DB on a server and our web front end, you know, whatever, on a second server. The benefit of that is that you can throw more resources into the things that need it. If you imagine you're running your DB and your Nginx or Apache, if, you know, you're still doing that, and I'm sorry. Um, on one server, and you're having performance issues, you're throwing hardware at all of it, even though actually probably Apache or Nginx, whatever, is fine, and it's the DB that's a problem. So you, know, you can separate those out. You can just scale up the DBs you need, and your, your web node is, is fine. It doesn't just have to mean that, though. Um, it can also be splitting out different sections of your application. Uh, before I worked at Tebex, I worked for a Magento uh, house. Yeah. Uh, and we had an interesting problem where uh, we had this big client, and every, every day at 1 a.m., the site would go down. Every day. Now we can all guess why. We had a cron job that was running, pulling in new products, sending order data. It was using 16 gig of RAM. <laughs> uh, yeah, we needed to fix that. Um, and it was just, it was causing it to fall over. Now, yes, the long-term fix is to make it not use 16 gig of RAM. But ultimately, that wasn't practical in the short term. So we spun up a separate Linode instance. Um, we put the, the, the processing that it was doing, or the heavy lifting, ran on a separate server. So the web, the web store was now absolutely fine. And that just chugged away and did what it needs to do at 1 AM every morning. Great. That is also separation of concerns. It doesn't just have to be DB, web, or Redis, DB, web, whatever. You can, if, if there are you know, long, long running processing things or demons that you're running or whatever else, they're a perfectly good candidate to move elsewhere. Or even an admin panel, whatever it might be. Um, 
So that's what we do, and we do, we do something very similar on, on our, our Tebex product. We have uh, separate servers that run some of our queue workers and things like that, because then they're not, if, if there is a long running process or a high intensity process running in the queue, it doesn't affect what we're doing, serving our web stores and, and everything else. Optimization. Technically, optimization isn't scaling, but it's kind of the same thing. Um, effectively, what you're trying to do with scaling is you're trying to be able to achieve higher throughput, right? Th that's what scaling is. So if you can reduce the amount of resources that a request takes, by extension, you're increasing your throughput. Yeah? So it's kind of, again, an optimization. If you are having scaling issues and, you, and your DevOps guys or your CTO or your hosting company, whatever, go, oh, well, it's going to be a week before we can get you provision your new server, which happens even today. Um, you know, doing some optimizations can help you kind of bridge that gap. Um, install something like New Relic. You know, I don't get a commission from New Relic, but it is an awesome bit of kit. If you don't use it, do check it out. Um, it really gives you a deep dig into, you know, individual transactions. You can identify individual, individual poor performing transactions and see exactly, you can see a whole trace of exactly where the bottlenecks are and where it's slow. If you've never tried it, do use it. There are other things available. I think Datadog is, is another one, um, but I've, I've never gone wrong with New Relic, so yeah. Enable your DB slow query log. You know, don't necessarily log every uh, query because there are, is a performance hit, certainly doing it in production, but if you've got particular queries that are being slow, then definitely look at what you can do to, to improve those. It can be as simple as adding an index. Um, way back when, I joined a project where they were having major performance issues um, and went in and sure enough, you tried to load up a certain, uh, one of the reports and it took 10 seconds, 15 seconds, something like that, but it was a report that was used a lot. Uh, 40 seconds later, adding an index, it was down to half a second. There we go. So that's a good one. Tackle the common bottlenecks. Um, consider what you think of as slow as well. Um, yeah, that example, there was a report and it took 15 seconds and it was used a lot, so that was a problem. If there's a report that takes 15 seconds but is only run once a day, meh, it's fine. Uh, but on the flip side, something that takes 200 milliseconds but runs 10 times a second is probably a major issue that needs fixing. So you know, don't necessarily just go for the biggest numbers. Think about your overall kind of the impact your overall system in terms of how often that's run as well. Uh, one of the common issues uh, when we're talking about uh, performance and optimization is the M plus one issue. Uh, who here knows what the M plus one issue is already? A fair few, good. Uh, so an M plus one issue, it's, it's a common issue if you're using most ORMs. Um, an ORM will tend to lazy load relationships by default. So what that means is if I've got a user and it's got a relationship of company and it's got a relationship of plan and it's got a relationship of something else, it won't, your ORM won't load all those relationships in when you call for that user. It will only load them in if you ask for them. So if somewhere else I go, oh, actually, what's the plan for this user? It will then load that relationship. That's a good thing, believe it or not, uh, because it means that you're loading less data to start with. Um, you know, if I, if I don't need those relationships, it's not gonna load them. I just, if I just need the user's name, I don't need to load the plan, I don't need to load their company or whatever else, which is good, until you use it in a loop. Uh, so, so this is a, a fairly basic example. Um, it's in Laravel, sorry. Um, and this is just grabbing some users where the company, I'm guessing that's a, an ID or something, uh, where the company is five. So it's gonna grab all the users for that company. Uh, now this second bit, uh, imagine that's in a, in a view or whatever else. Um, that's gonna loop through each user and it's going to grab the name of the department. So let's say we, we've got a list of, you know, it, it's a, a company system, you're grabbing the users and you want to, you know, in a table displaying what department they're in. Okay, so at the moment with this, it's gonna say, right, okay, grab all the users. It's one query. Go through a loop. Oh, I've got a user, so load a department. That's two queries. Oh, I've got another user, load another department. Three queries. Imagine if you've got 5,000 users. It's 5,001 queries just to render a table. That's insane, right? Now, imagine you're doing that twice. Now imagine you've now got a related department who has a supervisor. 
So you're now going to load each user. You're going to, for each user, load their department, so that's another query. And then for that department, you're going to load the supervisor, so that's another query. And actually, it might be more than one because you might have other, other relationships in there. So now, for each user, we're, we're doing two queries. If I've got 5,000 users, I've now run 10,001 queries. And I've probably killed my system. Success. Now, the proper way of fixing this is to define when you do your initial load which relationships you want. You can tell it, hey, I know I need the department, and I know I need the department supervisor. So load those relationships. And then what it will do, rather than running a query for each one, it will go, right, well, I've got all the users, so now get me all the departments where this relationship exists and do it as one query. That's, that's great. Um, so you can do that. There are problems with this. Um, if you've got an existing application, it can be difficult to know where all the relationships are loaded. If you've got them, you know, if you've got front-end developers that worry about the views and you're worrying about the back-end stuff, you might not know what relationships they've put into their templates. They could be doing some weird and wonderful things and you have no idea. We certainly have this problem because on our higher plans, um, our merchants can write their own templates. So they can load these kind of esoteric relationships and they change all the time. So you can end up eagle loading something that next week you don't need and not eagle loading something that actually you do need. So we kind of came up with a bit of a different solution and we called it the JIT just-in-time model. Uh, it's just an, an extension to the standard eloquent model and what it effectively does is check if the model that we have is part of a collection and if it, do, if it is, when we ask for a relationship on that model, it automatically loads the relationship over the whole collection. And it looks something like that. There's some extra bits and pieces because uh, Laravel by default doesn't tell you that a model's part of a collection, so we have to do some bits and pieces to say this is a member of a collection. Uh, but it does, it checks if it's in a collection. It does some checks because we've got some thresholds where we would load a relationship on a collection that had 10,000 items and it wasn't very happy about that. Um, so we, some bits and pieces, but, but effectively that's what it does. It goes, I'm, I am a model, I am in a collection, let's load the relationship with this whole thing. And that saved us something like 40% of our DB requests, just making this change. So that was a, that was a big win for us, certainly. Uh, go back on to scaling, hardware scaling. Improving the performance of your application will get you to a certain point. As I said, it, it's great, you can do some optimizations that you know, will buy you that time. Uh, that's, that's what it does, it's awesome. Um, but also, you know, there will be a point where you need to just give it more metal. Um, Hardware scaling can be quite straightforward. It doesn't have to be complicated. But it is something that you need to kind of think through before you just jump in with both feet to make sure it works the way you plan it to. Incidentally, if you don't know Commit Strip, it's a, a brilliant comic. Um, it's kind of the life of a, a digital agency. Um, do check them out. There's so many things I sit there and be like, yeah, that is literally my life. Uh, so there we go. The first thing to ask yourself is, what are you scaling? <coughs> you know, scaling only works if you scale the right thing. Uh, and it can be misleading. You, know, you fire up New Relic, for example, and it'll tell you, well, this, this, web, this web transaction has taken four seconds. And you immediately go, oh my god, the web node must be struggling. And actually, it's not. It's the DB. But because the DB's, you know, you've got a blocking request on the DB, the PHP thread that you're running is waiting. It's waiting for that DB to come back, and then it comes back, and, and whatever. So it looks like it's the web node that's, that's the problem, but actually it's your DB. So you do need to be very careful. As a general rule, your DB will start to struggle before anything else, uh, unless you've got like some super ninja DBA or something. Um, but use a performance monitoring tool like New Relic to prioritize what the, the quick wins are and, and, and where the big problems are. Um, there's kind of, when we talk about scaling, there's normally two things we can do. We can do something called vertical scaling. Uh, basically, vertical scaling is a fancy word for bigger servers. That's it. You know, you've got a server that's this big, you know, 32 gig of RAM, whatever, and you vertically scale. It's literally bin that server and get one with 64 gig of RAM. Done. Um, it has its benefits. It's, it's easy. <laughs> you don't have to worry about anything. You just go, right, well, I lift my code, deploy it on a new server, change my DNS, done. I'm going home for the weekend. Have a nice week. Um, it is, yeah, it's nice and straightforward. It is effectively a one-way transaction. 
in, in, if you've got kind of big chunks where you know for six months of the year you are much busier than you are for the other six months of the year, then yes, you could kind of move to bigger hardware for that six months and then move back. But if you've got kind of daily peaks and troughs, you can't keep switching between a big server and a small server. For a start, your hosting company would be like, well, no, you've got contracts for two now, thank you very much. Um, and second of all, it just wouldn't work. So there is that, that from it is kind of a one-way street. Once you've moved to a, you know, a, a larger box, you can't really move back. Um, typically, it's a higher cost um, than lots of little servers. Not always, but it depends. And you've still got that single point of failure. Now, what I mean by that is if you've got a, a server with 60, 64 gig of RAM, um, but it falls over, someone pulls the plug at the DC or whatever else, you've lost everything. You don't have any redundancy. You are, you are now effectively screwed. Um, I've been there. It's not much fun. So, you know, it works. And again, it's, it's often a quicker solution. So it's worth doing, but, but it's not, not the ideal. The other sort of scaling we, we tend to talk about is horizontal scaling. So that's lots of smaller, cheaper servers that are, that are working in parallel with each other. Um, so effectively what you get is you might have a cluster of, of servers for your web interface, and request number one goes to one server, request number two goes to the next server, request number three goes to the next server, and so on and so on, and then goes back to one and two. If you find you're starting to run out of resources, you just bung another server in there and it start redirecting requests. Now, instead of four servers, you're sending requests to five servers and then six servers and whatever. And the nice thing about doing that is when the traffic dies down again, you can bin off the servers you don't need and go back to your base four, whatever. This can be done on more or less anything. Uh, it can be done on web nodes. It can be done on Redis. We'll come on to databases in a minute because that's a bit of an interesting kettle of fish. Um, but it's a, it's a very efficient way of being able to scale up and down. It is more complicated. You need to consider things like if you're storing sessions to the file system, my first request might go to server one, and then my next request will go to server four, and my session is still on server one. That's not going to work. So you have to think about how you're handling sessions. Um, presumably, if you've got to horizontal scaling, you're not still storing the DB on the same server, so that shouldn't be a problem. But if you are, then stop. <laughs> um, File uploads as well, if you're uploading files to the file system like images, even if they're going to move somewhere else later, if you're temporarily uploading them to the local file system, they're not gonna be available potentially on the next request because I might now be on a different server. Um, so you have to kind of consider that and go, right, how do I centralize some of that storage or you know, use Redis for your, your session storage or even use a DB for your session storage, it, it works. Um, so there are ways of doing that. Horizontal scaling looks like that basically. You have at the top these load balances so that's what's doing the job of going, oh, well, yes, put this request on this server, put this request on this server, this request on this server, and so on. That's what's you know, directing traffic, if you like. Of course, we have two of them because redundancy. Um, and then underneath, we have these four web nodes that the traffic's being routed to. See? Not so bad, is it? There are a couple of gotchas. You need to know your architecture. We use horizontal scaling for our, our web nodes. By default, I think we run seven nodes. Over Christmas, we might run 12, 13, whatever. Um, we had a bit of an interesting problem. Because we do a lot of work communicating with game servers, a lot of them have quite stringent firewalls because the gaming industry can be a little bit toxic at times. A bit tiny. Um, and therefore, there are kind of issues with making sure that um, you know, people aren't being DDoSed or being attacked or whatever else. But it means people go, okay, great. So you're going to push commands to us. What's your IP addresses? What, today? <laughs> because we use AWS, and when you spin up a new instance, it gives it a new IP address. So we're like, no, nah, it could be anything. Today it's these six, tomorrow it could be others. So that was a bit of a problem. Now, there are obviously ways of fixing this. So we now have a couple of NAT gateways. We have two because redundancy. Um, and now all the outbound traffic goes through these NAT gateways, so we now have two fixed outbound IPs. Our customers are happy. We can talk to things like PaySafeCard, who requ require that the IPs are whitelisted, and things like that, uh, and that works really well. But we didn't think about it beforehand. We did all the scaling. We're like, oh, look how clever we are. Oh, shit. Um, so do think about all the possible ramifications as much as you can before you just dive into it. So I said we would talk about DBs as a, as a separate thing. DBs are fun. 
Um, scaling dBs is something that can be a little, little tiny, tiny bit tricky. Quite a lot tricky. Um, there's a quite an interesting blog post that I think puts this quite succinctly. The title of this blog post is, Relational DBs are not designed to scale. So there you go. So that's, that's good night. Uh, that's not wholly true. It is possible. But I'm going to be honest, none of the solutions we have are really complete. There's always going to be some form of trade-off. Normally, we're talking, when we're talking about DB scaling, we're talking about either sharding or replication. Um, like I said, they, they're both valid. They both have problems. We'll talk about sharding first for about four seconds. Um, if, you're a, if you're a really big company, if you're here and you're from Google or you're from Facebook or whatever, then do you want to come and do the talk? Um, but assuming you're not, sharding is very, very difficult to get right. Uh, what sharding effectively is, is having slices of your data in different databases. So you'll have slice one on server one, slice two on server two. So you're spreading it, you're physically spreading your data over two servers, five servers, 10 servers, whatever it might be. You, before you can do that, you have to come up with a way of deciding where that data goes. Because when you're going to save data, you have to then know, well, which, which shard am I is saving it on? So that might be done. You might break it down by customer ID, for example. You might have, right, customers one to 1,000 are on this shard, 1,001 to 2,000 are on this shard, and so on. That's fine. Um, you might do it based on some hash of the data you're storing, uh, whatever else. I think that's how Google does it. But if you don't get it right, you will be screwed. It's just how it is. Um, certainly, if you've got an existing application, sharding is probably a non-option. Um, and that's all we're going to say about it. <laughs> if, if you're a big company, great. If not, I would try and avoid sharding if you can do so. So therefore, let's talk about replication. Uh, unlike sharding, a replicated database will have the whole DB on each instance. So that means that in principle, you can query any of those DBs and get the same data back, sort of. As a rule, when we're talking about replication, we're talking about what we call master-slave replication. Um, what that means is you've got one master which receives all the right requests. So if I'm saving some data, I'm updating some data, I'm deleting some data, I make that request to the master. It then pushes those changes out to all of the slaves, which you then do read queries on. Yeah? This normally happens fairly quickly, within 100 milliseconds, give or take, but the slaves can fall behind. You know, it's not uncommon to see a slave that's two or three seconds behind the master. Um, that can be a bit of a problem. If you're, if you're doing, you know, you've, you're sa save, you know, saving a record and then showing that record back to the user, you, you've done it the right to the master. If it's not already updated on the slave and you say, right, grab it by this ID, the slave will go, well, I don't have that record. But I've just saved that record. I know the record's there. I've just saved it. But it's not on the slave yet. <laughs> so that's something you have to be aware, aware of. And you can, you can code for that. You, know, you can defensively program to handle those situations. Uh, but you have to be aware of it. Benefits to master-slave replication is that it gives you failover because you've got slaves that are already always being updated from the master. So if your master dies, you promote one of your slaves to master and you carry on running. Great, that works. And you can code for that as well. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable solution. There are things you have to code for. Um, but it still means you've got a bottleneck because you're writing to a single instance. So then we come on to master-master uh, -master replication. Now, this is something that I think is still specific to Pocona, I think. Um, but Glera cluster allows for master-master -master replication. So you can write to any instance in your cluster, and it then syncs across all of them. It's done in what they call near asynchronous. Um, so it, it, it's done synchronously, but to be done as quickly as possible, basically. Um, and, and yeah, we did this. We had three DB nodes, and we could use any of them. We could write to any of them, and that was great. Um, we used HA proxy to monitor the health of each individual DB node, and we would route traffic as, as appropriate. Notice how I just said we had three instances. Yeah, it didn't go very well. 
In fact, it was the worst week of my life. <laughs> um, we had issues. We do a lot of writing data um, to our RDB cluster. And even with all three DB instances in, in the same cloud environment, writing to each other, we were getting network latency that was just causing a backup and a backup and a backup of requests. Uh, I think we kind of pulled the plug when it got to about 40 seconds behind. Uh, we tried, this isn't going to work. Um, it works in a lot of situations if you're not too write heavy, but in, in our situation, it just didn't work. So temporarily, we just moved back to vertical sailing. We got the biggest box that DigitalOcean could find us and stuck a uh, Pocona on it, and it was fine again. Woo! Uh, happy days. Um, we've now moved to Amazon, uh, Amazon Aurora. Um, it is still now basically a master-slave replication, as we talked about before. So we've got one master that we write to, and then slaves that we read from. But Amazon Aurora is particularly designed to have high throughput for write transactions. Um, so that's worked really well for us. Uh, and the, the read reps are very low latency, so we've never really had issues with that either. You know, if we were doing it again now, then you know, perhaps we would, we would build separate databases for separate things. So at the moment, we have one database that contains most of our data. Maybe going forwards, we would have a separate DB that just has the payment transactions. We'd have a separate DB that just has the packages and the categories, which is kind of like sharding anyway. It's that separation of concerns. Um, but again, hindsight's a great thing, right? Let's talk about caching. Um, caching is very fast. That's about it. Dynamic content. We work in PHP, so we generate a lot of dynamic content, right? We're reading stuff from DBs, or we're consuming APIs, and then we're kind of mashing that data together and giving it back to the user. That's dynamic content. Whether that's you know, WordPress, or whether that's you know, uh, some other CMS platform or CRM, it's dynamic content. It's bad. We're bad people. Static content will always be faster. Anything that requires work will be slow, whether that's a third-party API, and then you've got network latency, and you're waiting for the other side to serve a HTTP request so that you can serve your own HTTP request, whether that's DB queries or even data processing. If we can cache some of that stuff and therefore not have to make those requests as often, that's going to improve our response times, which makes our customers happy, and it will reduce our server load, which makes us happy. Cache all the things. Well, all right, maybe not all the things. Um, again, it, this is like that whole deciding what to optimize. Um, something that's only going to be loaded once every 24 hours is probably a waste of, of cache. There's probably no point. If you're going to load that report once in 24 hours and it's likely to change in between times, there's no point in caching that, right? But if you've got something that gets called every second and probably only changes once an hour, or even if it's every second it gets, and it changes every minute, that's 59 requests that you can save by caching. So yes, do cache anything that makes sense. Uh, we use a shared Redis instance at Tebex. Um, the benefit of that is that the same cache is available to all web nodes. So I can, I can do a, handle a request on the web node one. That generates a cache entry. And then if there's a, a request that needs that cache entry on web node nine, they've got access to the same cache. So they don't, they're not both having to generate those queries, right? A good question, a question that comes up a lot, is how long should I cache for? The simple answer is as long as possible, <laughs> basically. Um, it, it varies. I mean, something like in a high traffic area, so like some of our enterprise web stores, even caching something for a minute can save a huge number of DB requests. So in that instance, something that, you know, caching for a minute is a good thing. Um, reporting data, we cache for 15 minutes. We have had customers that have gone, oh, well, I want my reports in real time. It's like, well, that's fine. We're going to triple your bill. Oh, no, 15 minutes is fine. That happens a lot. It's good. Um, some stuff that doesn't really change, things that are effectively fixed data, <coughs> might cache for an hour or more. Uh, something that we've started doing is we've, we now have certain caches that don't have an expiry, or they have an expiry of like 9,999 hours. Um, because actually, it's things that almost never change, and all we do is if someone makes a, an, a, performs a request in the control panel that does change the output of that cache, we then just manually invalidate that cache. Um, 
It's kind of like static page generation in, in, a, in a weird, twisted way. But it's all good. Um, another aspect of cache, now this is something that um, I did a lot when I, in my Magento days, because Magento is quite slow, is pre-warming. Um, normally with cache, you can only cache something once it's been requested, right? So the first person that requests that page or that resource has to wait for all the churning to be done to then be served it so that we can store it in the cache so that the next time someone gets a quick response. This is the kind of downside to cache, I guess. But if you know that you've got high traffic pages or high traffic resources that will be requested often, and particularly if you know they're slow to build, then there's nothing wrong with having a pre-warmer. Now that basically simulates the request, builds the cache, so that everyone else who requests it gets a cache, but it's actually your server that's dealt with the, the slower request to start with. I said, we did this a lot with Magento. Um, things like top level categories and other and offer pages and things would often be slow because they would need like 130, 150 DB requests. Thanks, Magento. Um, so we would pre-warm those pages. We would have something that would go and hit them every five minutes or whatever to pre-warm the cache so that actually no one else had to deal with that longer load time. Uh, if the page changes regularly, that's obviously not going to work because probably you're not going to get there before anyone else does. But for something that perhaps only changes once a day, if, you're doing a, if you know you input all your products at midnight, then actually at 10 past midnight, pre-warm the high traffic pages because they're not going to change for another day anyway. So that's, a, that's, that's possible. Um, threat protection. As I mentioned at the beginning, we kind of always have people trying to knock us offline. Uh, it's, it's a good cat and mouse game. Keeps, keep, keeps life interesting, right? Um, so it's something that, that we think a lot about because threat, anyone who's, a, who's attacking your system, be that a DDoS or whatever else, are using your resources. You're then making you have to scale further to stay online than actually you need to to serve legitimate requests. Um, there are different things that can, that can cause you know, that high rogue traffic. Uh, DDoS attacks is one that, that, that I mentioned. If you've, got an AP, if you've exposed an API and someone's consumers doing something absolutely insane, that's going to cause you extra load as well. Uh, or rogue web crawlers, normally from Russia, just saying. Uh, there can be a lot of background noise, a lot of your requests. You might be looking, going, oh, we're serving 200 requests a minute, that's awesome. It could be that 100 requests a minute of that is this kind of rogue uh, traffic. If you can get rid of that, you can halve the amount of resources you need to serve your legitimate customers. So that's, that can be a pretty big win. One of the obvious things is, is to rate limit. Um, consider what a reasonable number of requests might be. Um, in a lot of use cases, if you've got an API, actually even one request a second is probably too much. Um, it's, it, there's not that many APIs that change every single second that require someone to query every second. What that probably means is they're not caching it at their end. Um, so we looked at this and we went, so what, what's our worst case? And we have enterprise customers that might have 10 game servers behind one IP. So they shouldn't be doing more than a couple of requests a minute for each server. So that's okay. So, so 20 requests a minute, um, then some other requests to do like command execution or whatever else, and then round it up just in case we got it wrong. And we said, right, you shouldn't need to do more than 100 requests a minute. And we set that limit. And actually, we've never had a problem. We've, we've never had a false positive on rate limiting, which is nice. And it stops a huge amount of traffic. I mean, we, we, you know, we, we use Cloudflare, which makes life really easy. Um, but we, yeah, we, we use Cloudflare, it makes it easy. And then we've looked at our graphs, and sometimes the Cloudflare will be blocking 500,000 requests a, a minute that would have otherwise, we would have had to have used resources to serve. So that's a good thing. Um, I've mentioned Cloudflare. Other edge caching solutions are available uh, in true BBC style. Um, but you can use it to do lots of things. You can use it to cache static pages. So the home page of each web store gets cached for a minute. Um, so if someone's trying to you know, attack a, a web store and they're hitting the home page, Cloudflare would be like, yeah, okay, okay, there's your cache, have fun. You do what, you, we do this all day, it's great. They can provide a CDN. Um, you know, most of these, these uh, platforms have edge servers all around the world. So it will take a request for a JavaScript file, for example, from your origin. It will then serve it and push it out to its edge. 
and then each time someone wants that JavaScript, it just gets served out from there. That's good. And it also shields from a variety of attacks. Uh, it does traffic profiling. It looks for suspect requests, rate limiting. It shares intelligence with other, with other uh, users of Cloudflare. Uh, and we found that you know, helps us mitigate a lot of the, the bad traffic. Some stuff still gets through. As I said, we normally get about 100,000 requests a minute of stuff that, that beats the system, I guess. But it blocks out a lot of that stuff that otherwise we would be paying good money to deal with. So this was, as I said, kind of a bit of a whistle-stop tour, a bit of a high-level view of scaling. You know, in an ideal world, we would consider the scalability during the original build, but we know we don't. Uh, if you do, then you're a much, much better person than me, uh, and you know, thank you. Um, but there's often a case where you've, you perhaps not expected it to get as big as it was. You know, it, back, in, back when I started developing, we'd call it we're being slash dotted. Uh, God, I'm showing my age. <laughs> um, so, but there are still things. Even if it's an existing application, there are things you can do. The most important thing is to understand what's happening. Use New Relic. Use the tools that are available to you to actually get a handle on where the issues are, where you're, you need more resources, or where you can improve performance. Isolate the problem parts of your application. Think about that, that Magento job on its own server. We, we put that in a box, and it was all good. Um, and isolate them, and that will make it much easier to identify and to scale where it's actually needed. Thank you. So I think we've got, we've got a few minutes for questions. I'll just say, uh, before we do, um, you notice the, the, the joined-in link there. All the speakers would be really, really, really pleased if you could leave feedback. It's, it's really invaluable for us. Uh, you know, we enjoy doing this. We get to go and see these conferences that we perhaps wouldn't do, meet awesome people that we wouldn't otherwise meet. But to do that and to make our talks better and to you know, con other organizers into having us back, um, we need good feedback, or any feedback. You know, if, it's, if there's a way I can improve, there's millions of ways I can improve, and that's just in my life. Um, but if there's ways that, you, that we can improve, let us know. But equally, if you've enjoyed the talk, please you know, say so as well. Uh, any questions? I think there's a microphone just coming down. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, Thank you. Just wondering if you had any thoughts about uh, for scaling databases um, around table partitioning. So table partitioning is kind of a, a nice middle ground. And actually, we use table partitioning on uh, an analytics. We've, we've got a kind of a separate product that's not part of our mainline thing that's a, that's a game server analytics platform. Now, that deals with a lot of data, and we do partition that. Um, I don't really have, uh, yeah, it worked for us. It, I have, I'm, going, I'm not going to lie. It's not something I have a huge amount of knowledge about how it works underneath. I know it you know, splits the, the table into kind of basically child tables based on, we did it again based on a mod 10 of the ID, so we split it into 10 partitions, and if it was user ID 1 or 10 or 20, then it'd be in partition 1, no, 0, 10, 20, 1, 11, 21 would be in partition 2, and so on. Um, so it, that, that can certainly work, partitioning can work. Um, you need to be careful, because I've seen a lot of people that have partitioned, but then stored it all on the same disk, and then ended up with IO um, problems anyway. So if you're going to partition, you probably need to set it up to store them on, on separate disks or uh, you know, make sure you're not going to end up with, with IO uh, bottlenecks in, in doing so. But yeah, partitioning is, a, is certainly an option as well. Hi there. Um, Hi. We um, run everything through a, a large relational database. Mm -hmm. um, and we run into lots of problems with uh, locking and deadlocks as well. Yes. As the speed increases. <laughs> as the load and the users and everything just increases. Yeah. Um, and one of the thoughts that's been thrown up in one of our, you know, whiteboard sessions yeah. was... And those, oh my God, what's going on sessions? <laughs> <laughs> was, well, how, if we, uh, why should we use a relational so, uh, database for everything? We, we, we have to use it uh, internally for keeping uh, ACID compliance, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yep. and also for, uh, for it's great for reporting, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of data in there that could sit in maybe a MongoDB database where we don't have to worry yeah. about keeping everything in a single scheme. Yeah. Um, 
Have you ever come across any situations like that? That's something that, that we're actually moving towards at the moment. Um, bear in mind you mentioned asset compliance and reporting. I'm assuming you're using Postgres. You might not be, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, you're using mine as well? Okay, cool. Um, Postgres is a good option, incidentally. Um, at, uh, at, we don't use it at work, but I use it a lot for other things. It works quite well. Um, there's, there's no reason not to do that. I mean, the only thing you have to be obviously slightly aware of is any net, network latency, because if you're effectively doing more requests, if you're having to get some relational stuff, and then also going, oh, well, I need some of that other stuff as well that's now coming in from, a, from Mongo or, or, or whatever else, um, you need to, to factor that in and be like, right, so I'm now going to be doing two requests to get the same data. But actually, if the relational stuff doesn't change a lot, and it tends to be that kind of what I consider metadata, that's what changes. What changes, then yeah, that that's a you know that's a really good option. You need to consider how you're going to do that migration because if it's a live system and people are trying to change that data and then you've moved the data but the pointers in the code haven't changed, people are going to be updating the wrong record. So you might then have to go right. Well, we're going to need some downtime to do this. Is that acceptable? Uh, your business might go well. Actually, 20 minutes of downtime. Yeah, fine, whatever. They might go, no, it must be up for every second of every day. Um, I've been in both situations. Uh, but yeah, certainly, it's, what I would say is consider what's being updated. So if that transactional stuff is, is the thing that's updating a lot, you're not necessarily going to save those problems. But if, if it's the kind of other you know, kind of metadata or, or non-relational data that's the stuff that updates the most, then yes, that separate, again, it's that separation of concerns. And that would be a, a perfectly good way of going about it. Any more for any more, or are we all desperate for coffee? Oh, Sorry, one more. Um, yeah. So obviously so this, this is a big bottleneck, but network hops as well. And you have a lot of, mm. seems like discrete servers. Do you optimize your infrastructure in any way to account for lower network need? Uh, short answer is we, we, we trust Eddie Rest to do it for us. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to lie. Yes, this is the, the thing with anything. And you get the same with microservices, um, which again, I mean, that is a separation of concerns. Uh, but microservices, the question you get a lot is, how do I deal with network latency? And annoyingly, the answer often is, just do, <laughs> uh, which doesn't help. But yes, you, it's, it's a case of kind of factoring that in. So if you know you've got kind of flaky links, so, so for example, you know, we control all, all our servers and our DBs, and that's all within AWS, and AWS's network 99% of the time is, is pretty solid, and we don't really have issues. Now and again, you'll, you'll see in the error logs, we'll get a spike for about 30 seconds where it couldn't connect to the DB. You're like, Eddie West, really? Come on, fix it. Uh, but it, it doesn't last very long. But we do get issues because we're talking to game servers that aren't under our control that often do just not reply to requests. <laughs> yeah, we'll push a command and it's like, anyone, hi, you, you, you're going to deal with this? No, no, okay, good, fine. Um, so that is then a case of defensive programming. And you know, don't just code the happy path, which we're all guilty of doing. I do it, I did it yesterday. Um, I honestly didn't deploy it, Lee, promise. Uh, um, and yeah, just considering, right, defensively programming, going, right, I know there are going to be network issues. I know the network's going to drop out. I know Guzzle's going to throw a server exception error, whatever. And coding and, and programming for those eventualities as well. And whether that then triggers a retry or it then puts it into a queue to be done asynchronously or whatever else, just, you know, yeah, basically, yeah, just, just programming for that eventuality. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Oh, we've got one, oh, one more. We've got time for one more. So close. So close. <laughs> Sorry. Um, just trying to be a little bit more quick here. Um, you, 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 it does follow of using performance tools for your before and after. Yes. For, for when you are scaling. But what type of tools would you recommend for that type of situation, especially maybe also in relation to rate limiting? Okay, so I mean the tools that, that we use, um, it's a good question, I mean, and it makes a good point, is the important thing to do is to, to benchmark before you make changes. Um, otherwise, you don't know if you're actually doing good or bad. You, know, you, could, you could think you've done something that's gonna improve performance, and if you've not measured it beforehand, it could actually have a detrimental impact, and you'd never know. They say ignorance is bliss, it's a lie. Um, so so that, that was an important point. It wasn't the actual question, but I just wanted to, to, to raise that, so thank you. Um, in terms of the tools we use, um, obviously I mentioned New Relic. Now, New Relic is effectively an entire stack analytics platform. 
it will look at your underlying hardware, it will look at your, the metrics of your memory, your CPU, your I.O., whatever else. It also looks at your application layer, so you can, you know, it will give you where slow transactions are, it will tell you what's slow in a transaction. So if I've got a particular function call that's slow in PHP, it will go, well, this function sucks. Uh, I get that a lot. Um, and so that's, you know, so New Relic's a good one. Obviously, for monitoring your databases, the slow query log is good. Um, my SQL's version of slow query log historically wasn't very good. Um, so it had like second resolution. Well, actually, a half a second DB query is probably slow. And you couldn't do that. I think they fixed that now. Um, but if you're using something like Pocona or Maria, then they've had microsecond resolution on slow queries forever anyway. Um, so slow query log's a good one. And again, I mean, your, your usual monitoring tools will give you the information you need. You know, again, I mentioned your relic because that's what we're used to. Um, even the, the AWS logs, if you're using AWS, all those graphs that everyone tends to ignore actually have a lot of useful information. You can see if your DB request count goes up. You can see if your Redis memory usage goes up or you're starting to, you know, or Redis is having to ask for people to wait. We, we've seen this. We had a spike in Redis connection requests and there was actually a delay on serving responses of about 200 milliseconds. Well, that's a big problem. Uh, we had to fix that. So you can get the data from lots of sources. It's more about just gathering as much data as you can to get a clear picture of the whole, the whole situation. Cool. All right, another round of applause for Liam. Thank, Thank you. you.